Hey there, welcome to the Snakebird Podcast. My name's Josh. And I'm Steve. Together we invite you to join us as we explore the mysteries of Scripture, the realm of God, and freedom through Christ. So spread out your wings. And slither in place. Because this is Snakebird. Welcome listeners to the latest episode of the Snakebird Podcast. We're excited you're joining us today as we endeavor to strike the balance of walking in wisdom and gentleness in this world. Every so often we set aside time to take a reflective look at various biblical characters to discuss their wins and losses their successes and failures, and what we can learn from them, and then taking those things and applying them to our lives. That's right, guys. This is a snakebird profile, and our profile this time around is going to be Balaam. This is an Old Testament character that you may or may not have heard of, but um, he's a very interesting character, I would say. He's, uh, He's gotten three chapters and numbers dedicated to him. Uh, mentioned in the New Testament, and uh, just a really interesting character. I'm excited to get into it. He's a very interesting character, kind of polarizing, and there's a lot of wild information about him. Um, It's kind of sad to note that there's more in the Bible about Balaam than there is about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, it's <laughs> <laughs> When you're doing some research, you're like, wow, he gets more screen time if yeah. you're, you know, than she does. Yeah. And I mean, if you are familiar with him, there is more to the guy than just a donkey. There is a, <laughs> a crazy story that goes along with this character. And I'm not going to lie. I was kind of rusty. And I was just really amazed at how much application this study had to offer when looking at this this character, Balaam. Yeah, because you're right in the middle of not what I would consider a boring part of the Bible, but you're in the book of Numbers, which That's is true. <laughs> which if you've, is, if yeah. you've ever done the one year Bible and you get to Numbers, I mean, you know what we're talking about. It's, but it gets bogged down. It does. But this story, I mean, man, it, it livens it up, yeah. to say the least. Yeah, to give the context of what's going on, this is a significant event in the history of the children of Israel. They've been heading through the wilderness to the promised land, and essentially they've just finished 38 years of exile, of wandering around. Um, waiting for God to say, okay, it's time to go. And remember, they had the they had the unbelief, so a whole generation had to pass, and that's why they've been waiting those 40 years. And they've been having to deal with the inhabitants of the land as they go, and that's where they're going to meet um, the two main characters of this story as we kind of chronicle his life. Yeah, so they're like seeing the light at the end of the tunnel on this 40-year time out in the wilderness that God sent them on, and um, God's leading them into the promised land. He's, he's at the beginning stages of that, and they're defeating these pagan kings and people as they go. They're entering this this land that's, like you said, inhabited by, by these pagans. And um, right after Israel defeats the notorious Amorites and then King Og, Israel camps out across the way from Jericho, across the river. Mm -hmm. And they're just just kind of chilling there, you know. They're probably tired from a couple battles, and they're chilling out across from Jericho. And that's, that's where we get introduced to this this um, peaking king across the river that's he's like <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah he's totally spying on them and he is sweating bullets yeah we come to find out mm-hmm. it's and it's Balak is his name yeah king of Moab I always thought it was so funny that I mean Balak and Balaam are so similar in terms of just how they sound yeah so you have to kind of not get them confused or, that's gonna or... bite us throughout this <laughs> this presentation it just so you'll know yeah yeah <laughs> And so this giant, massive, wandering group of people are coming through your land. And, and I understand the the reason that he would be afraid. Mm-hmm. And so what does he do? Well, he um, he's just been informed that, you know, all these other pagan kings and people have just been leveled by this people called Israelites. And they're they're headed right towards him. And he's shaking in his boots, like you said. And it's at this point that we are introduced to Balaam, who is, um, in this region, he is the the region diviner, seer. Um, if for those of you who don't know what that means, that it, or is it diviner? Am I saying that wrong? I think you could say diviner or divider. <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he's he's a he's a warlock. You know, he's he's a guy that practices witchcraft. Yeah, he's and a man witch and not <laughs> a man witch, not a sandwich. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. 
No, but I would at this point, I'd point out that it's interesting. He was very well known in that area. Mm -hmm. And not just the Bible tells us this. Archaeologists have actually uncovered an inscription um, on a plaster wall eight miles east of the Jordan River that mentions the name of Balaam. as, And he's known as a, a diviner or diviner who had night visions. So this guy, he was well known in the region, so much so that archaeologists have found evidence of him. That is so awesome. Can the Bible be trusted? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Who would have known except being there in the pages of Scripture? That's right. So, it's anyway. He, he's called, um, from the study I was doing, I mean, he's called everything from a prophet to a seer to a soothsayer to an occultist. Um, even contextually, Second uh, Peter calls him a, a false prophet. Yeah. So he's... It's, it's going to be hard for us to put our finger exact because even scholars don't agree yes. on exactly what this guy was. Yeah. But one thing, as we will see throughout this study, that we know he did have a link into the unseen realm. Some sort of connection. He did. And uh, it wasn't fake either. So yeah. it, it, he's an interesting guy, and it's it's a head scratcher. Yeah, because really some are very straight. Some Bible characters we can present are very straightforward, and we say we know the facts. Acts and we know every situation that surrounds it. But yeah. this one, we're going to kind of have to say, hey, you know, a lot of it's up for interpretation or what your understanding of it is because yeah. of just the, the the limited information that we have and not understanding where that connection came from. Yeah. And, you know, many times modern people think, you know, ancient people were so primitive and superstitious that they were, you know, kind of brainless towards that type of thing. But we see in the Bible, like even Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, he could distinguish between those who performed tricks in those who did the real mm, thing. That's right. Um, the the witch in, at Endor that, that Saul uh, went to, to talk to. There, yeah. There was, there was fakes, but there was real. Yeah. And Balaam was one of these that was real. Yeah, that story with Saul, where she is able to connect Saul to Samuel, yeah. who's passed. Yeah. was weird. Which that's a whole other can of worms that probably belongs on another podcast. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> if you remember the story, even she kind of freaked out that it, the connection was made, yeah. which I mean, yeah. But it, it proves that it's there and that, there, you know, some have the ability to, to get there. So yeah. Paranormal. And I, well, and that's what I would say is that Christianity or God as a whole can't be explained away as normal. A man who is the incarnate embodiment of God coming to die on our behalf and raising from the dead is not normal. I mean, we, <laughs> right. we look to Jesus and say he is God in the flesh and he died on the cross and then rose again three days later. Yeah. But even this story, given the circumstances, has that particular air of the paranormal. It really does. It's just, it's, it's fascinating. It is. It's, um, you can go down some rabbit holes <laughs> if you're not too careful yeah, on that. Yeah, that's why we have have to look at it through the lens of a snake bird and yeah. then pull away those applications without getting, I guess, sucked in, yeah. qu quote unquote, where we're, we're Alice in the looking glass on the other side going, oh my gosh, my brain hurts. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> well, why don't we kind of walk through the circumstances of meeting him and talk about what, what he did and why he is who he is. Yep. So Balaam, he is a diviner, as we said. He is a guy that gets spiritual things done. And um, Balak sees this situation. He's like, you know what? I need Balaam. I need him to come and curse this people because he's terrified. Yeah. I mean, the rumor has it that these guys level pagans. And he, he is terrified of it. So he sends word for Balaam. And um, he has uh, divination fees in hand in attempt to hire Balaam to curse these Israelites and drive them away. He dials 1-800-CALL-A-CURSE. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he sure does. He's, yeah, that's He hilarious. gets out Google and he's like, who can I, who can I access <laughs> that? And, and the wild thing is that it's just taken as, as like truth that who, for some reason in scripture, it seems that whoever he curses actually is cursed and whoever he blesses actually seems to be blessed. Yeah. So, and again, that paranormal aspect of it. Yeah. And so that, that's precisely why he's called upon in this situation. And, um, you know, they, they get there to Balaam, these uh, messengers, 
And they they tell him, hey, we've got this money for you. King Balak needs you to come and curse this people. Mm-hmm. And my, I, I'm guarantee Balaam knows exactly what's going on here. I'm sure he's heard just like Balak what's been going on with Israel entering the promised land and killing these pagans. Mm-hmm. So he knows whose people they are, most likely. Yeah. And he says, you know... You guys spend the night while I inquire of the Lord, and we'll discuss it over breakfast, basically. Yeah. And I want to interject. A curse is something like, you know, you're all going to die before the age of 40, or um, may the, every step that you take, the land uh, reject you. And, and it's not like one long train of bee, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he's not cussing them out. No, here. no. He's coming out to basically <laughs> just put a pox on their, on their households. Yeah. So he, he's there to play place a hurdle in their way. Yes. So. Okay. So overnight, he says, I'm going to in quest of the Lord. Yes, that's right. And um, he does He does hear from the Lord that night. This this pagan practicer, he, yes. he hears from the Lord. And here's where I want to mention something really interesting. Okay. Is when he says, I need to ask the Lord, he refers to God's name, Yahweh. But every time in scripture, it says that God answers him back. It comes back as the very formal name of God, Elohim. Isn't that curious? It is. Yeah. And the implication is that while he felt like he had a relationship with God, God did not see the same way. Yeah. And then the mystery of God still communicating with him. Yeah. So yeah. that's it's a multifaceted thing here. It's something to, to chew on as we go throughout this. Yeah. Um, it, it, well, okay, so so God he comes to Balaam that night and he um, he says, "Who are these men with you?" Balaam says, "You know, they want me to go with them and curse Israel for King Balak." And he, this kind of has the flavor of God asking Adam and Eve where they are in the garden. He mm-hmm. knows where they're at. Yeah, he knows what's going on here. But he's going. He's coming to Balaam and he's like, hey, "What's going on?" You know, <laughs> he's like, "Well, they want me to curse your people," and God's like, "Don't do it." Yeah. Don't you do it. Yeah. Don't go with them. They're blessed. They're mine. Yeah. It's a very strong edict. It's a very strong answer. He says, they are my people and they are blessed. Mm-hmm. No. I mean, it's it, not flowery. Yeah. It's very direct. You did a good job on that stern. That's that's, <laughs> that's exactly what it probably <laughs> sounded like. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he, he tells them no. And so Balaam tells him to go home the next day. He says, um, I cannot go with you. God's not allowing it. Mm -hmm. And so they go back to um, Balak. And Balak, I imagine, is pretty ticked off. He's like, what do you mean? He said, no. Where's my cursor? (laughs) You bring thou no curse? (laughs) So he's like, all right, well, this just won't do. So he's like, get more noblemen. Uh, get, get some more people together, you know, more distinguished, more up the money. Ante. Up, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get some more money and tell them to go back, you mm-hmm. know. And um, they do. They go back. And all of a sudden, this whole delegation comes. And you can tell it's probably a lot of pomp and circumstance. And next thing you know, Balaam, I think he's got dollar signs in his eyes mm-hmm. as he answers the door because the next thing you know, they're saying, listen, it's not just the diviner's fee that we were going to pay you, which, side note, no prophet of God should be a gun for hire as it is. That's true. And and again, just talking about his history, let's sidebar real quick. Um, sometimes when I was reading for this, some people were saying that he just – prayed at night and God came and answered him. Others, you know, just to talk about the schools of thought, others believe that he cast bones and tried to read what they what they said. And and that was some of the way that he divined what was supposed to be. Um, oh, okay. And then others said that he mixed oil with water and read the, the pattern. So, so one school of thought thinks that he might have actually heard from God through the bones. I think he still had that that audible connection or that like, gotcha. but okay. I mean he's outside the realm of what a normal prophet of God oh, would have sure. been doing. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. so okay, so he at this point already has his answer. Yeah, 
but he's looking at all the things that Balak sent to him. And what and is he? <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned he has dollar signs in his eyes because his, his answer to him is, even if King Balak gave me his entire house along with all his gold and silver, it wouldn't make a difference because I cannot go against the command of my God. <laughs> That's what he says. <laughs> Which I wanted to see their faces when they're like, we didn't say gold or silver. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's only what I assume you had in your bags. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's sad because right there, his heart's already revealed. Mm -hmm. Because though he was obviously a man with significant spiritual gifts, he was not a man with a genuine heart after God. Yeah. And, And he says, I am seeking God's will. But he was also saying, I want something that is plainly not his will. Yeah. Because he already had his answer. And he clearly contradicts himself because he says, you know, I cannot go against the command of my God. Mm -hmm. But then he follows up with basically saying, just in case God's changed his mind, go ahead and spend the night so I can inquire of him once more. I'd really like to go, but God won't let me. But let me ask again. Yeah. Yeah. this This is interesting because Balaam claims Israel's God to be his God. Yet he's a practicing pagan. Mm -hmm. Um, He believed in God, the way I see it, just enough to claim him. But his doubt in God led him to idolatry. Mm. And it reminds me of of the devil-minded man in James um, 1, 7 through 8 says, One who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Mm. And that's what um, I think of when when I see when I see him being double-minded like this. Yeah. Second um, Timothy three five also speaks of men like Balaam by saying they hold to a form of godliness but deny his power. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Because to read that verse again, it's Numbers twenty two nineteen. It says, Now therefore, please, you also stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. That sounds so spiritual. Yeah. Let me seek my God about this one. But it was completely carnal. Yeah. Balaam was like a child who, once having heard his father's answer, is going to ask again, hoping that dad's answer is going to change. Yeah. Which we already know the answer. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. Yeah. And just to finish up my original thought there, too, is um, I see this as also being a problem in the church today. Oh, I believe in God, but I also believe in this other stuff. Um, I- I'm a Christian, but you see, I do things my own way. Oh, yeah. Um, 2 Timothy 3 9 tells us what happens to people who take this stance. It says, They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith. But they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Janus and Jambres. And I would like to point out Janus and Jambres were also magic workers, Mm. just like Balaam here. So it's it's kind of, um, it's interesting. We can see this stance throughout Scripture. All right. I just want to point this out. This is interesting that I found one commentator, one pastor that that actually says verse 20 gives Balaam a little wiggle room for in the morning. Like if God's going to say you can go, even though he's already told him no, is it says in verse 20, if they come to you in the morning, then you can go with them. Oh. And I looked and there's different translations read different ways. Okay. The um, NASB and the New King James um, say like, if they can come to you, then you can go with them. Oh, that's interesting. But others say like, since they've come to you, you can go with them. And again, it all comes back to like mm-hmm. God's permissive will versus God's perfect will. Yeah. And we already know the, the, the door is shut. Yeah. Like he shouldn't be getting saddling up his donkey yeah. and that's that's where they came to was like they didn't come to him in the morning they didn't even have a chance he already saddled up that soon to be talking donkey and went out to meet them and was like he said yes <laughs> you yeah. know <laughs> yeah he had it in his mind a certain way yeah regardless exactly it was it was a done deal yeah. no matter what god had said which again that comes back applicably to some people yeah god's like I didn't say you could, you yeah. know, and then they're like, well, I got the green light. You know, I'm, I've heard it said where it's like, okay, God, um, if just 
a bird will land right there in the field, and I know that's your will saying that I should be able to do this. And and <laughs> ne- never mind that the geese are flying south for the winter. Yeah, exactly. Like you know, <laughs> and he's standing in a cornfield. <laughs> or the or, uh, the, the yeah. pasture joke is that you know you drive around the block and you're like, if there's a spot in front of the donut store, then I know you're okay for me to get a donut. And yeah. It's like, well, on the twelfth time around, there was a spot. You know, nothing wrong with a fleece, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally understand what you're saying. And, and this is where a lot of people feel like there's a contradiction. Yeah. Because um, did God change his mind? Because all of a sudden, Balaam's like, God says no. And then God says, okay, go. Yeah. And so a lot of people are like, well, there's a contradiction there. Um, what What's the deal with that? Yeah, you're right. A, a lot of people do. They look at it strangely, but... This is not a foreign thing that we see in Scripture. No. Um, This is one of those instances where people misunderstand what God's doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, We see, like, in, for example, Exodus 9, 12, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exactly. You know, people are like, well, God did that to him. Why is he getting punished? God knew what he was going to choose. And another example is like when David takes the census. We looked a little bit at that on our profile on David, but one scripture says that God moved David to to take the census, and another scripture says that the Satan moved David to take the census. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what's already going on with that character, they've mm-hmm. already made their mind up. Yeah. And God is using it. He's like, you've made your mind up. All right, this is how things are going to get altered for my glory. Mm-hmm. It's not that God is forcing, you know. So this is, it's like I said, it's not foreign that we see this type of thing no. in Scripture. And God did not change his will. He had clearly declared his will, yeah. and then Balaam had decisively rejected it. Yeah, and I, I, I would point out that this is... Um, this is good evidence for us having free will. Mm-hmm. So we can move on now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So he saddled his donkey. <laughs> That's his preferred um, form of travel. Yes. And he takes off down the road. Yeah. And he is headed with this entourage of people with these great fees for his divining abilities. And they're headed to Balak, aren't mm-hmm. they? Yeah. They're headed that way. And... They have a what a, a stumble. They've got something in the road. He can't get get around at this point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the donkey of all things is the thing that sees it, which is awesome. Yeah, and of course, you know, as it's going, it sees that the angel of the Lord is standing in front of it. Yeah, and the donkey is the only one that can see it at this point. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, okay. I found that so profound. Is that a gifted? Seer, you beat me to it. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so, this is funny, listener. Listen to this. Okay, a gifted seer who had communication with God Almighty, who could see, you know, and curse and all these things, and it has to be the donkey yeah. that sees the danger. The donkey outsaw the seer. <laughs> yeah, it's what happened. Yeah, and it's ironic. It's, no. it's comical almost. That's why this story is so interesting. That's why you know, in the middle of Numbers, mm-hmm. you find this story that kind of blows your mind because you're like, oh my gosh, how did this even happen? Yeah. So the donkey sees this mm-hmm. angel, and so the donkey's like, well, I'm not going to approach that. I'm going to take a detour, and so he he heads into a field, and Balaam's like. What are you doing? You know, yeah. he gets ticked off. And so he starts smacking the donkey. And the donkey is probably thinking, don't hit me, you know. I'm, I'm trying to dodge this 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 entity in the road. Yeah, in fact, I'm saving your life. Yeah. So they get back on track. And this time they're headed down a narrow path. And the angel of the Lord stands in their way again. And I find it fascinating that it's a she-donkey. And she pushes herself against a wall to get out of the way and crushes Balaam's foot. Yeah. And that, I imagine, really set him off. Yeah. He goes off the handle again. Yeah. He's already mad that it went off on a detour. And now the the donkey crushes his foot. Yeah. And he blows up, starts beating the donkey again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He beats the donkey a second time. Okay. And so you're thinking, well, this is so weird. And they go again. And then, of course, the angel of the Lord positioned himself in a further place. And then again, a narrow place where they're 
at this point is either there's neither a way to turn left or right. Yeah. And and the donkey seeing the danger before the seer could see it just kneels down straight up and lays down. Mm -hmm. And he is so angry that he gets off and he's got his staff and he starts to, to strike his donkey. And that's, yeah, that's when God opens the mouth of the donkey and the donkey says, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? And just to read straight out of scripture, and Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand for now I would kill you. Yeah. It, ne- never mind that you're talking to me. Yeah. It just goes like, to me, it's so such a marvel that it doesn't even occur to him that a donkey is talking to him. Or perhaps we're seeing just how much paranormal he dealt with. <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe this was a, a normal thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, as the crow on his shoulder talked during the bones. Yeah. You know, I don't know, but it's odd that he didn't, you know, say instead Buck at of, it. Yeah. Like this donkey's talking to me yeah. with, with human words. Well, and it's funny. He's like, you abused me the way that you were acting. Yeah. And then the donkey comes back and says, "Am I have I not been your donkey on which you've ridden since I became yours to this day? Yeah. Have I ever done this to you? He says, you're the one being a jack wagon here. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, no. And it's so awesome that the donkey conquers him with logic. Yeah. Have I ever done anything like this to you, you fool? Yeah. All these years you've had me have ever done this before. And, it, and, it's, and it's just strange that they're even having this conversation. But yeah, like you said, he beats him with logic mm-hmm. in, in Balaam's fit. Uh-huh. And then God says, I'm going to open your eyes, you seer. Yeah. And the next thing you know is he looks and the angel of the Lord is standing in his way with his sword drawn in his hand. Yeah. And so he... He would do anything like any of us would do when we're in that presence, and he falls flat on his face. Yeah. He's he's um, terrified that he, mm-hmm. he realizes, oh, this is the gravity of the situation. Yeah. And he falls down. And, you know, at this point, I would, um, I would know that some people believe that this was an actual Christophany. Wow. Or um, theophany. If you don't know what either of those mean, it's a, a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ himself mm-hmm. that appears to people. We've seen um, cases of this in the Bible, which will be another podcast. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, yeah, it's it, that is one school of thought. Whether it was or wasn't, this was an angel of God mm-hmm. with a sword in its hand. Pretty menacing. Yeah, for sure, to say the least. Yeah. And... You know, a lot of people talk about his response because he says, I have sinned for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Yeah. To me, um, a lot of people think that that response is still kind of half-hearted. That it's like, I, I sinned, I did the wrong thing. Because it wasn't, he didn't wholeheartedly commit to going back. Like, I shouldn't have come. He just said, if this displeases, you know, if it displeases you, I'll go back. Yeah. And so there wasn't a full commitment to saying, you know, this wasn't even what you planned for me. I shouldn't be on this road. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good observation of that. I, I was just thinking as you were saying that of Proverbs fourteen twelve, it says there's a way that seems right to a man, mm-hmm. but its end is the way to death. Yeah. That's Balaam. And he's already committed. Mm-hmm. And so the angel of the Lord says, go with him. Yeah. But only the word that I speak to you, you shall speak. Yeah. And he doesn't hear it at this point, does he? He, he doesn't hear that word yet. No. That's coming. Yes. So so he's like, keep on going. I'm going to tell you something later. And that's the only thing that you're yeah. going to say. Yeah, because now the the whole entourage, this whole envoy is now arriving to King Balak. Yeah. Yeah, and then Balak gets word that Balaam's nearing the city, and he heads out immediately to the border. And he's like, 
what in tarnation took you so long? This is ridiculous. <laughs> Excuse me. It was 30 minutes or less or it's free. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and this, this is like an actual tone because it, he says in scripture, did I not tell you it was urgent? You yeah. know, basically. Yeah. Uh, was my payment too little? This you is, know? yeah, this is not Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he, he was, I mean, it probably took three weeks for them to get to and fro with yeah. these messengers. Yeah. So, so Balak's had enough at this point. Yeah, he's, he, when a king speaks, they expect someone to come. He's been waiting. Yeah. With bated breath. And Balaam basically, he's like, well, I'm here now. So there's only one thing I can say, and that's what God allows me to say. Well, and I, you know, I didn't even have this. It just kind of came off the top of my head. I wonder if that encounter with the angel of the Lord, whether that was a Christophany or not, Mm -hmm. was just that reminder of like, you better not say anything that doesn't represent what I'm, what I want you to say. Yeah. Because that is what he says. And I appreciate at least he had enough character to do that. That's true. Where he says, I must speak what God tells me to speak. And it's kind of, you know, it could have been a wake up call when he Mm -hmm. talked to that angel because the angel said, behold, I have come out as an adversary Mm -hmm. because your way was contrary to me. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that that might have been a wake up call that kind of you know what, when I get there, this is going to go a little differently than I originally planned. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good that's a good observation, too. Um, yeah, so Balak then takes Balaam from that point um, to a high place of Baal. The next day, they got to get to work. Yeah, they get to this. And a high place in ancient times is a place where pagans would, would worship their mm-hmm. idols, you know. Yeah. And um, that's where he takes him. And they, at this point, they can look across the way and they can see a portion of Israel over mm-hmm. there. And they get to actually see what, what's what been talked about. Yeah. And it's fascinating, you know, if you've done any study on the children of Israel, the way they camped, mm-hmm. um, because they at any point during these cursings couldn't see the whole camp from what I understand. But if yeah. they could have it would have been in the shape of a cross. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that. Yeah. that that's that's something neat to think about. Yeah. And um, Balaam kind of has this big order. He's like, I need these altars and I need these sacrifices in order to get um, my diviner skills yeah. ready. And, of course, they follow through with that. Yeah. They prepare seven altars, seven bulls, and seven rams. And um, Balaam tells Balak, he says, you stand here by the altars. I'm going to go see um, what God is going to have happen here. Mm -hmm. And so um, Balaam heads down to a bare hill, and God finally reveals to him what he's going to tell Mm -hmm. King Balak. Mm -hmm. And the message from God to Balak is found in Numbers 23, 7 through 10. And this is a massive paraphrase. Yeah. But it is basically, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? <laughs> That's basically, if you've got the whole thing, feel free to read it, Josh. But I, I, we, we don't need to. We're not here necessarily for that. I yeah. do want to point out that it's awesome that he says, um, who can count the dust of Jacob or even number one fourth of Israel, which implies that he's not seeing all of them. He's only seeing just oh, yeah. a portion. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, let me die the death of this, of the righteous and let my end be like his, yeah. like Israel. I want to live like them, mm-hmm. which is fascinating again, because of just the weird oddity paranormal connection that he's had to God, but he's not really in the fold. Yeah. He's not a friend of God. God doesn't see him like that. Yeah. And I love what happens next because Balak has been sitting there. He's already upset. He's already been waiting for his his champion, his yeah. curse monger to come in and and really, you know, put the smack down on the children of Israel, really, you know, throw the stinky cheese at him. Yep. And what happens? He showers them with praise. Mm-hmm. He showers them not with um with a curse, but with blessing. Because that was the word from God. Exactly. And that's all he was to speak. And Balak, he's like, I brought you here to curse these people, mm-hmm. not to bless them. Yeah. And Balaam, he's, he basically says, my hands are tied. This is what God's allowing, mm-hmm. you know. And Balak says, well, you know, I've, I got this. All right, all right. This didn't work out. <laughs> 
let's go to a different high place, you know? <laughs> let, let's see if Bale allows this from a different angle over here. <laughs> yeah, they're putting some miles on their sandals or their entourage or whatever yeah. they're doing to get around to these places. Exactly. <laughs> and so um, I imagine that Balaam's probably walking at this point. He didn't want any more issues with the donkey. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, they <laughs> Balak and Balaam... Uh, at the second Baal location, they do the whole song and dance again with the with the altars, and Balaam goes to God again. And this time, God, he replies with a really stern tone. Mm-hmm. It almost had a flavor to me of the responses in Job. Oh, yeah. I mean, just a real, a real stern. Direct. Um, you stern. have the audacity to try me again. Mm-hmm. Almost that type of tone. And God makes it very clear that he is for this people, Israel. He is connected to Israel like the horns are connected to an ox. Yeah. God is with them. Yeah. I mean, just a stern, uh, I am with them. Well, and even like verse 23 of Numbers 23, it's really interesting because he says, For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. Mm -hmm. So almost like, I see what you're doing, Balaam, or what you've been involved with potentially, and I raise you the fact that I am God, and my word reigns supreme. And obviously God, knowing in turn that he would go back and give that word to Balak. Mm -hmm. And um, Balak tells Balaam, okay, all right, don't bless him or curse him, all right? Just forget it. Forget it. Okay, I can just see see him ripping his hair out and going, ah! You know, yeah, yeah. and it's funny because he's like, he's just saying, don't, don't curse him or bless him, okay? And then you'd expect it to be like, let's call this thing off, but no, he says, let's try another high place. <laughs> let's go, let's go again. He's, he, he's not, you know, maybe God will will allow a curse from that location. It's triple or nothing at this point. Uh, he's not very bright. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. And so this time, this time, Balaam refuses to go with King Balak. Mm. And this man, I, I got to say, as I was studying this, this this part really hit me hard. Um, Balaam turns toward the wilderness and he sees Israel tribe by tribe. And beholding the image of Israel, the seer finally sees. It clicks. And at this point, the Holy Spirit falls upon him and he prophesies. And this man, this prophecy here it's just mm-hmm. it's it's really beautiful honestly it's uh numbers 24 3 through 9 and i don't know if we want to actually read it here but um it's just basically he's looking and he sees god's plan unfolding before his very eyes just looking at israel yeah and he prophesies of what ultimately leads to jesus i mean it's just it, it's pretty amazing. He he prophesies of of the future here about David, and and I believe it's suggestive even further than that. But as I um, it, it's just very interesting. Balaam finally saw God's plan unfolding. Um, and and I thought you know at this point the way he was talking in this prophecy, I thought he would repent. Mm-hmm. I thought he would, but. He didn't, we find out, when we get to the end of this. And I, I would point out here, um, this, the fact that he didn't repent and he saw God's such perfect will right there in front of him through the Holy Spirit, this to me is a perfect picture of what Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is really talking about. And I just want to read that. Um For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, all of that happened in this prophecy of Balaam, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Mm-hmm. And I know Jesus hasn't died yet, yeah. but this describes perfectly the mindset of what Hebrews 6, 4 is talking about. Mm-hmm. A person who has partook in the Holy Spirit, God's perfect word, the prophecy. Balaam did all of that right there. Mm-hmm. I mean, not in a shallow way, in a deep way. Yeah. And then he turned away. And so that, that to me, I wanted to mention that because that's a perfect example of what Hebrews 6 is really talking about. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? It really is. And to see him finally shed the, the pageantry of it and, and trying to conjure up this curse, 
and then just to focus in. And it's like he took up his oracle, which I don't know what that might have been, but all of a sudden the next thing you see is that um, he just has the Spirit of God fall upon him. And actually one of the prophecies that he says, one of the lines in that prophecy that he says is, blessed is he who blesses you and cursed is he who curses you. And I mean, that still applies to the way that the nation of Israel rolls today. That's true. Because, you know, you mess with Israel, you mess with God's people. And a lot of times anyone that has done that throughout history, they're, they're taken off the map. Look at Babylon. Yeah. Where are they now? one of the strongest ever, they're gone. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And that's amazing to see. And so that third prophecy ends and Balak is just so frustrated that, I mean, to the point where he, he's just clapping in anger. He strikes, you know, it says he strikes his hands together and he says, I've called you to curse them, but you've bountifully blessed them these three times. Yeah. And he says, just go home. Yeah. Just just get out of here. And then even in that, Balak still prophesies a fourth time. Yeah. And you know what's interesting that I see in Balak's response to him? He, he basically says, see how their God has kept you from the riches and honor I offered you, mm. basically. And I thought that that's, isn't that a perfect example of the blindness of the world? Mm. In their eyes, they see money. They see social status. They see meaningless security but what a person filled with God's spirit sees is a perfect picture of what God has done and is doing Hmm. you know the hidden mystery of what Christ is to us and I just I found that fascinating that's that's just like the blindness of the world Mm -hmm. yeah see what their God has kept you from my riches yeah yes so wow Yeah, and before that, that fourth prophecy in in Numbers 24, verse 14, and I quote, And now, behold, I am going to my people. Come, and I will advise you on what this people will do to your people in the days to come. So that's the final prophecy. But what stuck out to me was, I am going to my people. And I was kind of thinking about what he meant by that. Is mm-hmm. he going back to his hometown? Or is he is he kind of considering himself now kind of God's people? And I don't know the answer yeah, to that. But it's ambiguous. It, it almost still, it, it appears that he's still kind of lukewarm. He's on the fence. Oh, we know he is. But mm-hmm. I wonder if that's not what's going on here. Um, but I found it very interesting. Given the circumstances we'll talk about in Numbers 31, I don't think he made it all the way home. Yeah. I think he kind of hung around in the area. And, yeah. You know, he, it, it, and it also appears that he, he might have still had his eye on the reward money. Maybe. Too. Um, Revelation 2.14 suggests that he instructed Balak to place stumbling blocks before the children of Israel, yeah. trying to get them to curse themselves almost. Yeah. So he might have been trying to go about it another means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay, before we get there, yeah. he has this fourth prophecy and it's almost like, it's almost like telling the guy that hired you, I didn't even come here to do this job. At this point, everything's gone off the rails. Let me just say what God's putting on my heart because yeah. it seems very from the heart. And this is the prophecy that talks about Jesus. Yeah. It is. You know, it's so fascinating because it's a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Mm-hmm. And and some even alluded to that the wise men that come to seek uh, the star in Bethlehem actually refer back to this ancient scripture yeah. going, oh, we were seeking that star. I, that doesn't sound too far-fetched to me. No. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And... Uh, like you said, um, do you have anything more on this fourth prophecy? No, just that it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. It, and it was, it's amazing that God spoke it through Balaam. Exactly. But like you said, it seems like he didn't want his paycheck to be gone, to vanish. Yeah. And so he said, hey, I can't curse them directly to their face. Yeah. That's not what God's allowing me to do. Instead, I have some advice. Yeah. And it's tragic. It really is. Because um, what we see down the line in Numbers 31 is that he instructed or he advised 
um, Moab or the Midian, who is the neighbors of Moab, is why don't you go down and intermarry or intermingle, invite them to a party, mm -hmm. invite them to one of your worship sessions. And as soon as they get there, they're going to see the the way that you worship your God and the idolatry that takes place. Yeah. And the next thing you know is that they were led into idolatry. They took the bait he knew that they would. Yeah. And it's the first recorded instance where Israel ever worshipped Baal. Yeah. And unfortunately, after that, it was so many times. Yeah. But this was the, the, this was the genesis of it. Yeah. The scripture comes to mind, it'd be better to have a, a millstone tied to your neck and thrown into the sea than to have one of these little ones stumble. I know that's children, but this is God's children. Exactly. Yeah. And it... The story that came out of it, it was so gross. And I mean, Phineas had to come up and there was a plague. And yeah. and um, and we see the reason that we said we don't think that Balaam went back to his home was that he was killed with these five kings there in Numbers 31. Yeah. Yeah. Likely still making his rounds uh, to the pagan kings, performing his uh, diviner um things that he did for money mm -hmm. yeah he probably he probably brought his own tent and set up shop and was like yeah. hey you know fortune yeah. telling or wh whatever he did i'm <laughs> active in the region lately so <laughs> yeah. since i'm here <laughs> yeah little uh, did he know yeah and it's just it's just tragic it says um these women caused the children of israel through the council of balaam to trespass against the lord in the incident of peor yeah. And because of that, there was a plague and, and all that. And so, like you said, uh, he's mentioned in the New Testament in Second Peter and then in Jude and then in Revelation. Yeah. And all of those contexts, none of them are positive. They're no. all warnings against him. They're coming. Yeah, they're putting him alongside Cain. And, and I mean, he's just it, it puts a very bad light on him. He, mm -hmm. he loved money rather than righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that's his legacy is greed and um, foolhardiness. I mean, the dude who had to get corrected by a donkey. Yeah. Stepping out of God's will. And, and I think while he's an interesting person to talk about, especially just to take those few chapters and look at them in that lens of a snake bird, more important than the paranormal, more important than even the blessing necessarily that he gives, which is still carried out. I mean, it was carried out through Jesus on the cross. It was carried out through through God coming. We need to make those applications to where we don't become like Balaam. Yeah. And I, man, it's so, there's so much application to today. Yeah. Because because of the things that he was weighing in the balances, mm -hmm. we weigh those same things even now. And it, there's a reason God dedicated three whole chapters and then multiple references in the New Testament to this guy because he wants us he wants us to recognize where sin might be growing. Yes, yeah. So snake birds, um, a couple of applications that are really simple, but. Uh, right off the bat that we need to take from Balaam's life, uh, first and foremost is we need to watch out for greed. Mm -hmm. I mean, first and foremost, you can't be a hireling because that's what he was. As he said, the only way I'm going to get involved in this is if there's a paycheck in it. Yeah. And originally we found out that there was a definer's fee for him. And again, he's it's a very gray area of knowing what kind of... Um, fortune teller or seer or uh, soothsayer he was. So we don't know uh, if he ever was really in the business for God. Yeah. But I get concerned when church leaders are in this for money. And yeah. it's all about what do I get out of it there, versus... Yeah, there are people that peddle the Word of God. Oh, yeah. And that's precisely what we're looking at here not to do. Yeah, and then it trickles down into just... A lay person, a person who's just part of a church, it trickles down into greed. Yeah, it does. And, you know, I, we can't allow money to be a driving motive um, for spiritual things. Yeah. No. And so um, another application is um, thinking about all the flowery things he said that were um, sounding spiritual, but it was all in an effort to manipulate God to let him go. Don't give lip service. Yeah. And don't think you can manipulate God. God 
when he says no, he means no. And, and there are times when he says no for a moment. Yeah. But then there's times where he says no for a reason. Yeah. And every time I love this saying is that every time God says don't, what he's actually saying is don't hurt yourself. Yeah. I'm saying no for a reason. Sometimes you might find yourself in God's permissive will. Mm-hmm. But don't mistake in that for his his original choice, his, his original perfect path, will, his yeah, perfect will. what he wanted, and you know we, we talk about that, and that's something we'll continue to talk about. It's never something that's not going to be at least at the forefront of our discussions because it is so important. Yeah. But Balaam kicked the door open. Yeah, he didn't, you know, he didn't like check the handle and go like, oh, it's locked. I'm going to walk away. I mean, he put his shoulder into that thing and and knocked part of the door frame off to make that thing happen. Yeah. And and that's dangerous. Yeah, that's true. And he it seemed that he was paid well for for even dabbling in the truth. Mm-hmm. So just cuz you're being blessed doesn't necessarily mean you're on the right track. No. No. Y- yeah, exactly. And then, you know, the last thing that was really scary is the whole influence that he had. Because that's what Revelation warns us against is the doctrine of Balaam, where he was saying, hey, you know, be influenced by these people. Go and and walk among the world. You know, and there's some people that teach to be in the world, you have to be of the world. And that's such a dangerous thing. Because he was saying his doctrine was the lie that it's permissible for saved people to act like unsaved people that God's grace gives us the right to disobey his Mm. law. Mm. And that's that cheap grace. That's that false Christianity that's out there. And it's, that is, it's death. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you said it, um, well, when you were talking about the person who has an unrepentant heart, Mm. um, is that it's really scary that this man was a mouthpiece for God yeah. And to think that even in this day and age, there are people out there that can be speaking truth for God and still be on their way to hell. I think that's something that we should all take note of. That, that a person can be mightily used by God, speaking God's words that are truth, but that person themselves is not going to heaven. Mm. Um, they are not right with God, yet they are being used by God. So that's, and that's, I know that sounds a little weird and that can enter some gray areas, but that's what we see in the story of Balaam. So it's important that we, that we know God, not, not through any other mediator than Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, uh, um, theologian F.W. Robertson said, brother, beware, see how a man may be going on uttering fine words, orthodox truths, and yet be rotten at the heart. Yeah. Or to put it more simply, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Yeah. And it's all about doing that heart check and saying, what's my motive? What am I in this for? Did God tell me to do this? And all those things. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, that, that's the most important. Because at, at any time, God was righteous to forgive Balaam mm-hmm. had he repented. Yeah. But he didn't. Well, and then there's that one scripture that freaks me out is that person that came and said to Jesus, Lord, Lord, did I not serve in your name? Did I not cast out demons exactly. in your name? Didn't I do this for you? Yeah. And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. You peddled in my name. Mm-hmm. Ooh. I, that was, Jesus didn't say that. That's, no, that was my, that's my a... <laughs> thought on it. It's something that we should all be giving ourselves a, a heart check from time to time. What are our motives? Yeah. What are our motives? Yeah. So that's our snake bird profile on there Balaam. I, I know we went all around it and talked a bunch about it. I mean, this is looking to be about an hour. Yeah. But he's an interesting character and there was a lot to cover. And, and even in all of that, there's still a lot of gray area and ambiguity about who he was. And so yeah. one thing I can say with assuredness is do not be like Balaam. Absolutely. Yeah. And we likely probably didn't even cover all that we could have talked about. So we encourage you, listener, if you're out there and we didn't, uh, reach out to us. Let us know if you have any questions or even topics you want us to get into from this point forward. We'd love to hear from you. 
Yes, that's one of the biggest driving um, factors for us is that connection that we have through um, either the website where you can send us an email at connect at snakebird.com or connecting with us through Facebook. It's really encouraging to hear your feedback, your reviews. Um, even if you have something to say that you're like, hey, I, I heard you guys say this and I didn't hear you mention this. So. Um, Your feedback is so important because this is a dialogue and not just a monologue from two guys sitting in behind microphones. Yeah, and if this uh, podcast has benefited you, um, chances are it might benefit somebody you know. So please share us with your friends and family on uh, whether it be social media or however you can do that. And one way that you can really help us, and this does help, listener, if you could give us a good rating or review, um, that can help get the Snakebird podcast out there a lot better to more people. So if y'all could do that, that would really help us out. We would deeply appreciate it. Yeah, that would be huge. So, always remember, whatever you do, wherever you go, no matter what life throws at you, there's never been a better time to follow the words of Jesus. And not be like Balaam, but be a, a snake bird. bird.